Hi, I'm Jan Bekoski from Coast Spring Harbour and uh, we're here on the occasion of the 83rd Coast Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology and the topic this year is brain and behaviour and I'm delighted to have Joshua Gordon with me here, a long time uh, resident of New York but in more recent times director of NIM NIMH. Joshua, thank you for taking the time. Thanks. I confess, I confess I missed your talk, but gives us an opportunity for you to tell me and other people about it. Sure. So I um, spoke generally about what I perceive as the challenges and opportunities in mm. psychiatric neuroscience. In particular, uh, we in, in psychiatry, in trying to understand our disorders and help our patients, have significant challenges that we face uh, around the burden of our disease. Uh, around challenges in terms of diagnoses and whether they correspond to the real entities that are causing people suffering. Um, and uh, in terms of what we call biomarkers, mm -hmm. you know, tests that we could do in people to help diagnose them or, or right. guide them, uh, guide treatment decisions, uh, we have none. <laughs> um, and our treatments, although they generally do work for many people, don't work well enough for many and, uh, and don't work for a significant chunk of the patients who need help. So uh, you put those together and, and uh, we face considerable challenges in terms of trying to help people who are suffering from mental illnesses. The opportunities though are I think equally impressive. Uh, so we now have, for example, in the area of genetics, uh, knowledge of 200 plus places in the genome that predispose to various psychiatric illnesses, including schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression. Each one of those places in the genome that's associated with psychiatric disorder represents a clue as to the biology underlying mm -hmm. the disorders. And those clues are then opportunities for us to understand uh, and potentially develop treatments for these illnesses. Mm -hmm. uh, we also face a tremendous opportunity in a specific area of neuroscience that's really blossomed in the last 10 years, circuit neuroscience, where we've gained, at least in mice, the the ability to monitor and modulate neural activity in very, very precise parts of the brain, not just anatomical parts, but specific neuron-specific cells in the nervous system, specific projections, specific wires within the nervous system that have allowed us to dissect the, uh, the elements of the brain that control behavior and the hope is that in understanding those elements that we can, again, develop knowledge and or treatments for psychiatric illness. And then uh, the third area that I think presents a, a unique opportunity at this point in time for psychiatry are computational and theoretical approaches. Uh, so we have big data approaches, machine learning approaches, but also uh, modeling approaches and theoretical mm -hmm. approaches that allow us now to ask questions about how the brain produces behavior and how that might go awry in psychiatric illness with greater sophistication and greater precision. So I think if we were to be able to exploit genetics, neural circuits, and computational approaches, uh, we can make progress more rapidly than we've been able to do in the past. Let's start with the genetics, because when I first came to the Bambury Center in the early 90s, it was a time when there were hunting for disease genes was, was, was well underway and with Mendelian central, uh, single disorders it was being very successful mm -hmm. and there was this wave of enthusiasm and optimism about the application of such strategies to the psychiatric disorders and the, it really didn't pan out in those days. No it did not. No it did not. Yeah, so that's the time at which I was being attracted to psychiatric neuroscience actually. The Huntington gene had mm -hmm. just been cloned and there was a lot of promise that we would soon have genes for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and the like. And what we learned over the next really 20 years was that psychiatric disorders were different from disorders like Huntington. Um, they are the result not of, not of you know, a small number of genes, each of which uh, contributes a large effect size and right. each of which really dictates whether you're going to get the illness or not. Instead, they're the result of combinations likely of hundreds, if not thousands, of genes. And uh, that made it much more difficult to find them. And it's only been in the last five years where we've really made progress. Yeah. Um, it, it, it 
makes it more complicated to turn that progress in terms of d gene discovery right. into neurobiology because of the uh, complexity with which these genes contribute to the disorder. You can't just study one of them and then understand the disorder. You need to study probably yeah. hundreds yes. and then of course yes. the interactions yeah. between them. Yeah. Got, um, the, these, are, these are locations with potential asso potentially associated with, with psychiatric disorders mm -hmm. have been found by genome-wide association studies. Predominantly, yeah. yeah. And of course, they, they actually provide a very large location, generally, don't they? This is true also. That may contain, so the work to actually get down to the two or three genes that might be relevant at each of those, itself is a huge Right, task. even at each of those locations, yeah, right, yeah, right? So yeah. we have 250 locations. Uh, the folks who advise me on this tell me we might have 10 or 15 of them where we're of reasonable confidence we've mm -hmm. got it down to a couple of genes. Um, most of those locations we really don't know. So that's where our efforts are right now in trying to understand in each of those locations what does the variant that predisposes towards a, a psychiatric yeah. like schizophrenia, what does that variant do? Does it disrupt one gene? Does it affect the expression of several genes? And then which gene or genes are the affected ones? Right. Uh, so that we can begin delving into the, yeah. into the biology. So it's a multi-step process. Identifying the place in the genome is really just the first step. but these are steps that we did not have, yes, that we could not right. take yes. five years ago. Yes. So. And I'm, I'm afraid I've taken us really away from the topic of, the, of this symposium, which is about brain and behavior. Right. Uh, moving on to your next two things about, yeah. it's been really striking listening to the talks, um, the combination of a biological mental psychiatric uh, disorder with what to me are very hardcore neural circuit theoretical analyses, and I think it's been very striking. Yeah, there's been a lot of talks at this symposium in particular uh, that are getting to the point where we can merge the two approaches that I talked mm -hmm. about, neural circuits and computation. So uh, one of the best ways to do that is to use computation to break down or analyze behavior into its component parts. Uh, the example I give is something as simple as uh, mood, right? Mm -hmm. So I can say I'm happy or I'm sad, or I can rate my happiness and sadness on a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 100. Um, but that doesn't really give me much to go on if I want to understand the neurobiology underlying mood. So uh, there's been uh, some studies which have been attempted to break down mood into the kinds of things that the brain might be computing in order to create a sense of mood. Right. Uh, one of the things it might be computing is how many good things have happened to you recently. Uh, another thing, it might be how pessimistic or optimistic you are about the future. Do you expect more good things to happen or, or not? And then, are those expectations met? If you expect good things to happen, do they happen? If you expect bad things to happen, yeah. do they happen? And so, uh, there have been a, a few people who have built, if you will, mathematical formulas with mood on one side and with these other variables on the other and then asked how well do those variables explain my self-report of mood if i say i'm happy is it because i've gotten lots of rewards in the past and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it turns out they do a fairly good job mm -hmm. and so then one can ask okay if you've defined these different computations these different neural calculations that might make up my self-report of happiness what's different about patients with depression compared to uh, people without depression and you can ask is it because they don't respond to rewards as well or because they have more pessimistic expectations of the future mm. those sorts of things and then even more importantly from my perspective you can then map those neural computations onto neural circuits you can ask okay where in the brain is this expectation of what's going to happen is this pessimism or optimism residing and so these are the way forward that you can imagine, and then yeah. you can use neural circuit technology to really prove it. Yeah. But presumably you can only use neural circuit technology or you, we're not yet at a position about being able to do experiments injecting retrograde things in human beings. Well, that's I think something we need to consider in the future. Mm -hmm. For now, what we want to do with neural circuit technology is to be able to understand the circuit elements characterize them and figure out how to develop treatments that might modulate them. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's stick with that happiness example for a mm -hmm. minute. Let's suppose that we found that this 
pessimism thing. This ability to predict the future uh, might reside in an, a brain structure like the nucleus accumbens. So the nucleus accumbens is a place where we think this calculation of the expectations for the future, good or bad, is made. So we can delve into that and we might find that a particular neuronal subtype is really important for that calculation. Let's suppose it's the D1 containing medium spiny neurons. I'm making this up, it probably <laughs> isn't, but let's suppose it is. So we can imagine trying to upregulate or downregulate the activity of these D1 containing medium spiny neurons in order to help people who are too pessimistic and therefore have depression. Um, so how would we do that? Well, if we learned enough about what makes D1 medium spiny neurons tick, mm -hmm. we might be able to develop a drug or even a psychotherapy or a deep brain stimulation right. method that would target those neurons specifically and help people with depression. One day we can imagine that we might need to actually use technologies like we do in mice that would artificially Probably. stimulate them and, mm -hmm. and directly target them. But for now, we think of it more of the neurobiologic approach, which is trying to understand everything we can about those circuit elements so that we can develop treatments that target them that are non-invasive and, and yeah. safer. Uh, this seems very far from the traditional research programs in psychiatry. So I think uh, for a long time, clinical psychiatry research and neuroscience research have both been supported by the National Institute of Mental Health. Mm -hmm. I think what you've seen over the last 10 or 12 or 15 years is a merging of those two. People who are doing classical clinical research characterizing patients and testing treatments are being asked to define where in the brain mm -hmm. those treatments are, 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 um, are, are affecting the, where, what mechanisms in the brain those treatments are using, and they're also being asked to take into account what we know about the nervous system from studies in experimental systems like mice or zebrafish right. or whatever. And the neuroscientists are really trying to incorporate richer behaviors in their mm. uh, experimental system models so that they might better translate to humans. So I see uh, that these things are really becoming more, more, more integrated in, in, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, your point about uh, more realistic behavioural models or, or assays, uh, I was actually rather taken that someone actually showed a, a Morris water maze, which I, I would have thought was probably the least typical. <laughs> uh, well, you know, obviously Morris water maze is useful for uh, measuring certain kinds of memory. Uh, it's a maze that rodents run, which humans don't normally have to do. Right, yes, yes. Um, but what we're looking for in, in terms of what we see as, as potentially better or more helpful tests in the future are ones that actually, you know, again, take a behavior, break it down into its component parts, and it's a behavior that you can adapt from humans to animals mm -hmm. and from animals back to humans. And that way you can test these fundamental neural circuit mechanisms. You can delve into their neurobiology, identify the elements, if you right. will, in the experimental systems, and then in humans figure out whether those are the right places to look for treatments for disorders, which really only exist in humans. You can't really study a disorder yes. in that. Well, I was, I was just going to make that same point that um, animal models of psychiatric disorders, of course, are faced with that. How, what's a schizophrenic mouse? You, you, you develop an assay that yeah. you think is measuring some component of what might be schizophrenic. Well, we have to, or, the, you know, that's exactly right. Um, animals uh, can't get schizophrenia, by definition. Schizophrenia is a disease in human beings. Um, but animals and other experimental systems can be used to ask questions that are relevant for the disorders. And if you think about it, that's what science uses models for. Mm. Science, doesn't, science doesn't build models to recreate things. Yeah. Science builds simplified models to test hypotheses about the bigger things. So if we're going to build a model of the solar system, we don't recreate the sun and the earth. Uh, we have little balls <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> right? Yeah. that capture the elements of the sun and the earth and the other planets that we care about to answer the question that we're trying to answer. Yeah. So it sounds as though uh, you know, these three, three points we've just gone through, they're going to keep you occupied for a while? Yeah. Are you, uh, Me and the thousands of scientists we support throughout yes, the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, 
good luck with things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joshua.